Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's quarterly investor update conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, you will have the opportunity to ask questions during the question and answer session. Please note this call may be recorded. I will be standing by should you need any assistance. It is now my pleasure to turn today's conference over to Robert Lowry, Chief Financial Officer. Please go ahead. Good morning, and welcome to MGT's third quarter 2018 investor update call. Joining me is Steve Schaefer, MGT's Chief Operating Officer. Bob Holmes, our interim president and CEO, was unable to join due to an unexpected conflict. However, due to the timing of our filing and the short week given Thanksgiving, we thought it was prudent to have the call this morning. The agenda for today's call is for Mr. Schaefer to give an overview of the company's status and business to date. I will then discuss financial highlights of the company for the third quarter and year-to-date periods. Then we will hold a Q&A session. Prior to starting the call, I'd like to read the following forward-looking disclaimer. During the call, we may make forward-looking statements about our future financial performance and other future events or trends. These statements are only predictions that are based on what we believe today and actual results may differ materially. These forward-looking statements are subject to risks and certainties, assumptions, and other factors that could affect our financial results and the performance of our business, which we discuss in detail in our filings with the SEC, including today's earnings release, the risk factors, and other information contained in our most recently filed Forms 10-K, 10-Q, and 8-K. MGD Capital Investments assumes no obligation to update any forward-looking statements we may make on today's call. And with that said, I'll turn the call over to Mr. Schaefer. Thanks, Rob. Good morning, everyone. So my comments on this quarter are going to be pretty short and to the point. Uh, as you all know, we're in the process of making our transition from our facility in Sweden to our new location, which we're pretty excited about, which is in Colorado Springs, Colorado. The status of that, that transition right now uh, is on time for us to start mining, as we've stated in, uh, in a prior press release, by the end of December. Uh, our crews are out in Sweden at this time. We're, we're packing and palletizing uh, over 250 pallets of miners. You know, as everyone knows, we had over 6,000 miners out there on location, so it's quite a task. And uh, considering the the minimal amount of labor, which is in uh, the northern parts of Sweden at this time of year, uh, it becomes a, a pretty long and arduous task. However, we will accomplish this on time, and we will meet our stated goals of, continue, of continuing our mining at full power uh, in our new Colorado location by the end of December. Uh, I'd like to speak a little bit about uh, the timing of this move. You know, we considered, uh, considering the, the situation we had out there uh, where there was a, a lawsuit from the energy company against the hosting center that we were dealing with, uh, with the power set to be turned off, this was kind of forced upon us as a corporate decision to make, make a move. Uh, we thought about the timing of it, and we felt that we had a, a, an extended time period whereby Bitcoin economics might suffer. You know, the language coming from analysts and technicians were pretty negative. Uh, the overall sentiment regarding Bitcoin and crypto in general was, sentiment, was negative at that time. Uh, so we felt that that coupled with were delays in the new machines being coming to the market, uh, we felt we had a window that would be, you know, two to three months to be able to make this transition without suffering any economic losses. Uh, and in fact, you know, that did play out to be the, the, the case here in, in this transition because, at, frankly, at the price that we have right now, low 4,000s, we would be mining at a loss out in our facility in Sweden. So with that being said, you know, I, I want shareholders to know that we did not suffer negative revenue and any losses uh, by taking this action and making this move. And I think it's a critical step in our growth going forward and giving the company an opportunity to, to reassert ourselves in 2019 uh, when hopefully Bitcoin itself uh, gets itself back on more solid footing as one of the largest and, and most profitable miners. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to talk a little bit about the facility out in Colorado Springs. So this is a pretty famous or, or, or notable uh, 
former Intel chip production plant. Uh, in total, uh, there's about 600,000 square feet and upwards of 85 to 90 megawatts of power currently feeding the location. In our case, we were lucky enough to find what we felt was a, a perfect fit for our short-term needs, uh, which was about 10 megawatts. Uh, the 10 megawatts that we are going to have will be in a standalone building, which will be independently metered. So it gives us the security of having a private location uh, within the campus of the Garden of Gods in Colorado Springs, and will allow us to uh, have our own little uh, 10 megawatt location within the larger campus. However, more importantly, as I mentioned, there, there are currently about 40 megawatts available from this hosting partner at this time and upwards of another 40 megawatts uh, available through 2019. So as you can see, this location will provide us with a, an excellent opportunity for growth uh, if the company moves forward with our 2019 plans for growth. Uh, and the new machines come out and the more efficient hardware comes to market and becomes more cost effective, uh, I think this will give us a great opportunity for expansion. Uh, and that's, you know, that's really where our mindset is. You know, I think, I think everybody uh, in, in the Bitcoin world has kind of been either, either taken, uh, taken by shock by the, the Bitcoin pricing or, more importantly, in our case, the, the decrease in profitability to Bitcoin mining. You know, Bitcoin mining, you know, everybody probably probably has a, an idea that the, the profitability from peak to current today's uh, profitability is down well over 95% at this point. Uh, I think we, we all, at this point, have to take a, see, a step back. Everybody within the mining community has to s sit down, reevaluate ourselves, and decide what are our growth plans for 2019 and position ourselves for what we all feel will be a rebound in crypto. You know, I personally feel that it's inevitable that we're going to see greater adoption and an inflation in the Bitcoin underlier, as there's been over five and a half billion dollars to date invested into Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and blockchain technologies. Most, most of that money has come in in the last year and a half from large institutions. Uh, the greater adoption of, of these institutions will drive more global acceptance and global use cases. With that being said, you know, I, I fully believe that you know, we have to position ourselves, uh, do what, the, what we need to do as a company to have ourselves uniquely positioned uh, with a strong balance sheet to move forward and take advantage of the opportunities and to move quickly and swiftly as the opportunities uh, present themselves to buy uh, discounted hardware, as well as to expand uh, in an expeditious manner uh, if, if and when we see the economics are improving. So that's our mindset. Our mindset is looking forward to 2019. I'd like shareholders to have hold that same view. I think it's prudent for us to you know, look at this quarter and the current status as an opportunity to get our feet on solid ground and look forward into the next year and and uh, get excited about the growth that, that I think we'll have as a company as well as uh, Bitcoin overall. One more comment I'd like to make uh, in regards to this quarter, and I'll let Mr. Lowry go into more detail uh, in his economic analysis of the quarter, but I wanted to make a comment uh, from my point on this uh, we took a $3.5 million write down in this quarter. Uh, this was a non cash charge. Uh, it was essentially uh, it was an accounting issue that was uh, regarding the economics of mining. You know, the analysis was done internally. We felt that it was prudent and justified to do an economic analysis on the economics of mining and what the value of the existing S9s were that we had on balance sheet. You know, at, uh, at the end of Q2, those machines were listed at a $2,500 net valuation. Uh, upon our analysis, we felt that you know, those machines are no longer have that type of future earning power and or should be valued at that price. Uh, so we felt it prudent, uh, albeit, I think we're we're one of the only publicly traded miners that have taken such action, but
but uh, we took a, what was called an impairment charge based upon that. You know, the one point I want to make very clear to everyone, these machines are not impaired in any way. Uh, there's no physical impairments. Uh, the machines were turned off on our own accord. They're being packaged. And when we move them to Colorado, they will turn on and function and perform at 100%. Uh, so this was strictly an accounting issue. It was not a physical charge, albeit it did put a, a, a larger loss to our quarter. And uh, with that, I will turn it back to Mr. Lowry, uh, whereby he'll be able to discuss more detail on that, as well as all our other financials within the quarter. All right. Thanks, Steve. Um, talking about the uh, quarterly results, our revenue, all, all of which is derived from Bitcoin mining, was 589000 for the third quarter in 2018 and $1.9 million for the nine-month period, compared to 515000 in the third quarter of 2017 and $1.2 million for that nine-month period. These amounts reflect a 14% quarter-over-quarter growth and a 61% growth in the year-to-date periods. Operating expenses were $8 million during the third quarter and $20 million for the nine-month period, compared to $10 million in the third quarter of 2017 and $18 million for the nine-month period. Operating expenses um, included, as Steve said, a non-cash $3.7 million impairment charge related to the cryptocurrency mining assets. Excluding this impairment charge, which Steve says is an accounting exercise, operating expenses Operating expenses totaled with $4.4 million for the quarter and $16.3 million year-to-date. The operating expenses are comprised of cost of revenue, G&A, and in 2018, the non-cash impairment charge. Operating expenses decreased $2.1 million, or 20%, compared to the prior year due to three things. One was a $6.7 million or 70% decrease in G&A expense. This resulted from a decrease in non-cash stock compensation of $6.4 million, a decrease in legal and professional fees of $589,000, partially offset by an increase in payroll and related expenses of $21,000 and $287,000 in the third quarter of administrative costs to operate the Sweden facility. Secondly, um, there was a $1.1 million increase in cost of revenues re compared to the prior year, resulting from an increase in our mining operations. And cost of revenues does include depreciation expense in the quarter of $1.4 million and $189,000 in the quarter of 2017. And then thirdly, there was a $3.7 million non-cash impairment charge. Now, when we look at operating expenses for the nine-month period, Compared to last year, they increased by $2.2 million, and that is comprised, I can summarize in four items. One is the $3.7 million non-cash impairment charge, the $2.5 million Sweden restructuring charge, $2.6 million increase in cost of revenues resulting from an increase in our mining operations, and cost of revenues for the nine-month period include $2.6 million of depreciation expense, and in the prior nine-month periods, it was only 385000 And then most importantly was there was a $6.2 million or 38% decrease in G&A this year over last year for nine months. This resulted from a $6.2 million decrease in stock compensation, a decrease in $1.4 million for legal and professional fees, which was partially offset by 890000 increase in payroll-related expenses, and $683,000 of administrative costs to operate Sweden for the nine months. So that said, the net loss for the quarter was $7.8 million compared to $16.5 million for the quarter in 2017. This reflects an $8.7 million decrease, or 53%, compared to the prior year. And if you exclude the impairment, the non-cash impairment charge, the net loss for the quarter would have been $4.1 million or $12.4 million less than the prior period. The net loss for the nine months was $18.8 million compared to $26.6 million for the nine months in 2017. That concludes my remarks for the operating results and back to the, um, to the host.
Hello, Catherine, can we open it up for G&A, or uh, Q&A, sorry? At this time, if you would like to register to ask a question, please press the star and one on your touchtone phone. Once again, to register to ask a question, please press the star one keys now. Keep in mind that you may remove yourself from the question queue at any time by pressing the pound key. We will pause momentarily to give everyone an opportunity to join the question queue. Again, that is the star and one if you would like to join the question queue, and we will take our first question momentarily. And our first question comes from Ed Wu with Ascendia Capital. Your line is now open. Yeah, thank you for taking my question. My question is more generally on your outlook for uh, cryptocurrency and, and Bitcoin. I know it's been you know, particularly weak the last couple of days, but just wonder what your uh, general outlook is. Good morning, Ed. Thanks for asking a question. Um, look, I think uh, you know. I, I think any any of us that, uh, especially those of us that have a Wall Street background, um, you know, volatility as we've seen in the last two three days. I think we've learned through hard knocks and hard experience to to ignore these type of extreme volatility swings. Um, you know, I, I think I uh, I even tweeted out uh, yesterday or the day before. Uh, you know, my my advice is unless you're day trading or you're or you're swing trading Bitcoin, you, 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 it's probably a good idea just to ignore the the noise here and the volatility. Um, I'm very very confident that 2019. I don't know if it's going to be first quarter, second quarter, uh, or towards you know more towards the middle of the year. But at some point, uh, I believe we're going to have uh, a pretty a pretty inflective move in the prices of Bitcoin, which will be coupled with, I think, uh, broader adoption of, of uh, some long-sided products. Obviously, the, the, the backed product is probably the first one with a physical delivery. I think that, that helps to uh, mitigate some of the unabated uh, leverage to the short side that we're seeing on a lot of these uh, offshore and decentralized exchanges. Um, with that being said, I think from a mining perspective, uh, more specifically to us, uh, Pricing of hardware right now has, has come down considerably. Um, I think it'll I think it'll come down even more. I think there's a lot of room uh, for um, some of the 10 nanometer products, uh, even the, even the 12 nanometer products, for the manufacturers to be able to produce those and bring the price in a little more. So I think a price contraction can work to our advantage on those products. You know, although I look at the seven and the eight nanometer project products as you know uh, exciting new more more efficient the economics of purchasing uh those units may not be the be the best uh move from a fiscal standpoint as you're going to pay obviously a premium for having the, the newest um you know most most expensive chips in there um so from our perspective you know we're looking at we're doing a real micro analysis on all the hardware um not exclusive to Bitmain. In the past, we've we've pretty much mined, you know, mostly all Bitmain. We we had a few Canaan products uh, at the beginning, but uh, for the most part, everything we have right now is a Bitmain product. Uh, however, we're not exclusive to Bitmain. We're looking at uh, other manufacturers. Uh, I'm leveraging a lot of my contacts and and uh, folks in my network to try to uh, you know to try to keep keep ourselves on the on the forefront of when these new products are coming out. And we'll do an analysis, and as capital allows us, uh, we will we will expand. Because as I said uh, on my statement before, you know I think right now is critical to be positioned for 2019. Uh, it, it, Bitcoin's not going anywhere, and you know it's going to necessitate uh, a more robust network than it even has now. And we're going to do everything we have we can, and it's in our power as a company to try to try to be that. Be that that uh, that entity that's out there providing power to the network and and uh, you know enjoying the what I believe will be uh, a pretty aggressive and inflective uh, appreciation in 2019. Uh, thank you. My last question is: Have you seen uh, the competition to mine Bitcoin uh, decrease or reduce at all as the price uh, has come down? Yeah. So interestingly. Um, you know, albeit I think it was a latent response, uh, you know, 
inherently we should have seen a decrease in network size as the price came back from, you know, we'll call it over 10,000 down to the 6,000 range. Uh, we actually saw an increase in network size, obviously, and in a, in a, in a, a correlated increase in, in difficulty range, uh, difficulty rate uh, at that time. But clearly at this point right now, um, you know, there, there are very few miners that can mine at $4,000 uh, and not lose money. Uh, so I think we're, you know, we're, we're going to see a, a, a pretty precipitative uh, decrease in difficulty rate and network size uh, if the prices stay in this range. So I, I, I shudder to say that it might work to the benefit of those, those of us that are in the mining space for price to be range bound at a lower level as it will kind of, uh, you know, it'll kind of eliminate some of the, some of the higher cost miners and, and, in the long run, it might decrease the the overall network size when Bitcoin starts to go up. Uh, you know, on more specific to your point, we've seen uh, on some of the the algorithms that I, I follow, we've seen about a six to seven percent decrease in in the last forty eight hours uh, in the, in the uh, proposed uh, difficulty change, which I think comes in like eight or ten days. So uh, you know, we're we're talking about a six seven percent decrease that's tied with with the drop in Bitcoin prices from, you know, 5,500 to 42, 43, whatever, whatever we're at right now. So, um, so we are definitely starting to see that expected correlation between pricing and, and network size. So I think those of us that can figure out how to, how to survive and scratch through, uh, during the lean times, we're going to be uniquely positioned for, you know, to enjoy the good days when, when the prices go up and, and difficulty will lag. You know, difficulty is always a lagging indicator as it only adjusts every 2016 blocks, whereas prices changes every, you know, every minute of every day. Great. Well, thank you for answering the questions and good luck. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. And once again, if you would like to ask a question today, please press the star and one on your touchtone phone. And our next question comes from Glenn Thompson. Your line is now open. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, so I just have two questions. Um, the first one is very important to me because I've been with you guys for over a year and a half now. I have a large chunk of my uh, retirement and savings in your stock right now. Some will consider that insane, but I really believe in you guys. Um, I want to know, what are you going to do to protect the shareholders that have been here this long uh, in restoring shareholder value? Um, I most OTC stocks, you know, they go through this dilution period, um, drive the stock price down, um, and then they do a reverse split, uh, and the previous shareholders get screwed over, and then the new ones jump in after uh, the decline after the reverse split. Um, so that's my first question. The second question is um, about the uh, lawsuits. I know a lot of it is ambulance chasers, as they would call them but want to know how you guys are going to combat and deal with that, as well as the um, LAD situation with the SEC. Okay, Glenn, Steve, I'll, uh, I'll try to take these uh, uh, probably in reverse order. So the, the short, quick answer, it would be the LAD situation. Um, Mr. LAD's dealing with that on his own, uh, on his own time. Uh, he's covered under our DNO, uh, and I'll answer the question because we get quite a few inquiries, yes, he is on paid leave. Uh, he is still on our board of directors. So Mr. Ladd is part of our company uh, as far as uh, director and officer insurance. So um, hopefully that that clears that up. Uh, you know, we don't have any any liability as a company. We have not been named as as a, in, the, in any complaints uh, from the SEC on on that issue. Uh, as far as the as far as the ambulance chasers, yeah, I'll use your term. I think it's pretty uh, pretty applicable. Um, you know, these these guys have uh, they're they're like predators. These guys have gone after uh, every company that's dropped in price. They they go out there and they file these uh, informational statements uh, that they put out, and somehow or another, it's allowed to be put on. On, on a public company's business wire, it tags to our, our stock symbol, and every day for 40 days, our, our shareholders of any public company that's under the attack of these individuals, they have to suffer by seeing 
you know, on a current news, people click on the news and it's another uh, solicitation from a law firm for uh, a lead plaintiff. Uh, in the case of our prior, our prior case, which was dismissed, dismissed in summary judgment uh, with prejudice, it was completely thrown out, you know, on a, on a, on a lack of merit. Um, it, it, it was clearly, it was clearly frivolous. Um, we believe that this is the same situation. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we, you know, we are covered. This is covered under our director and officer insurance because this is a corporate issue. Um, you know, we do have deductibles, so it's not without any burden to the company. You know, we, we had about $500,000 in deductibles. Uh, last year that uh, that we paid and where you know we will have deductibles uh, if there's a, 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 an actual case that we have to fight uh, with that being said though the the, the larger cost of litigation are covered under DNO insurance and you know we fully believe that they're completely without merit and you know it's it, 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 to me I believe personally I, in my personal note I think it's a travesty that these things are allowed to happen I think that you know, they're, they prey upon small cap companies, and the only the only people that are hurt by this are the long shareholders uh, that invested their hard earned money into the company. Because when they're thrown out with prejudice after six months or twelve months, guess what? The shareholders don't get that shareholder equity or that decrease in, in market capitalization back. You know, yet these guys don't have any any. Uh, there's no means for for trying to do that to recover that. Or to go after them for bringing, you know, a ridiculous and frivolous case. So uh, I'll leave that at that. Um, Glenn, repeat your third question again, because I want to answer it, uh, you know, succinctly and, and not not be off topic. Uh, yeah. So um, my uh, first initial question was, um, you know, these longtime shareholders that have, um, you know, like myself, have like been here for a year and a half. Um, you know. Most OTC stocks go through this uh, upstage and they uh, dilute. Uh, the stock goes down, then they do a reverse split. Um, and the previous shareholders that had been long are um, screwed over. And um, I know that we've had a drop in BTC price, and we got the issue with the SEC with LAD and these ambulance chasers. I know that's had a great effect on the share price, but. I want to know what are you guys going to do to be different than all the other previous OTC stocks that have screwed over the long <laughs> shareholders? Because I have my retirement savings and everything in this, really hoping for the big picture with you guys. Um, I, I just I want to know what are you going to do to build shareholder value back and protect the long um, shareholders like myself? All right. Look, I appreciate the question. Um, yeah, I'm gonna. I can only answer it as candidly. Uh, yeah, I think. I think shareholders know. I. I. I speak straight, and I. You know, and I don't hold punches. Look, I think. You know, in in the case of where shareholders are at now, the best thing that we can do as a company is to one, stay sol solvent, utilize our equity line of credit. You know, that's our. That's a great asset. I know shareholders might not realize that. But there are many companies out there in the mining space that that don't have an S3 or an S1 filed or, or effective, I should say, whereby they can survive these times. There are going to be a lot of companies that are going to go under because mining's not profitable right now, and they're not going to be able to rely on their corporate equity to float their balance sheet through these next two, three, four months, uh, hopefully not longer than that. Uh, to survive these times, and they're going to go under. In our case, we're fortunate enough that we do have the equity line of credit, so we can cut our fat, keep keep our operations as lean and mean as possible, and get through these hard times and be positioned for the run-up in, in the future. Hopefully, the equity price will share that you know we'll share that uh that run up with you know with with the growth. I mean, to just answer you, you know. As, Candidly as I can, all we could do is just do our jobs the best we can do it. I mean, there's no magic beans, Glenn. We, there's nothing that we can do, or no magic bean I can pull out of my out of my pocket and say, "Hey, I can get the share price up." One, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't or shouldn't do that as as corporate management. Uh, two, you know, where believe me, where you know, we're we're not here for we're not here 
to see to, to see the stock at ten cents. We're here because we're trying to we're trying to build something here. You know, unfortunately uh, for everybody involved, I think you know we've seen a ninety five plus percent decrease in, in in economics. Every every Bitcoin related stock that trades publicly has been you know, uh, d you know smashed in valuation. Uh, with that being said, I mean all we could do is just try to survive it. Um, get through it and position ourselves for growth going forward. And, and you know, frankly, that's all we could really do. I mean, it's uh, there's there's nothing that uh, nothing beyond just doing the best job we can um, that I could think of. You know, that 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 can protect shareholder value better than just doing our jobs. And at this time, we'll go ahead and take our next question from Dan Smith. Your line is now open. Hey. Hello. Hello. Good morning, Dan. Hey, I'm sitting over here in Shaman, China. How are you? Okay. Okay. Ni hao. Hi, ni hao. Uh, listen, uh, I want to ask a couple questions. Right now, and, and thank you for taking the, the question, um, how many Bitcoin do you currently have on hand right now? We don't carry long positions. All the Bitcoins that we've mined, we've monetized uh, to support our balance sheet. So we've okay. – uh, what, Rob, what's our number we mined uh, for the year? Yeah, we've, we've mined uh, somewhere, somewhere around 450 coins for, for the year. Uh yeah. Including yeah. our partnership okay. machines. Okay. My understanding was is that the company was going to keep ten percent of the mining as a reserve. Is that correct? Yeah, that we had previously announced that. Unfortunately with the economics, uh, you know, the choices we would have been faced with was keeping ten percent of the coins on balance sheet and then going out and selling more more equity and more stock and diluting the stock further. So we, we felt that it was in the best interest of shareholders to to sell the coins and and you know in hindsight uh, considering that okay. we sold you know that those coins were sold at at ten thousand down to seven thousand I think uh, we probably got a better deal and the shareholders fared better on that uh, on okay. that instance. Can I can I pitch an idea? Is that okay? Why not? Uh, this, uh, I'm sorry, but this wouldn't be the appropriate place. You could. You could email us uh, directly no, 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 at IR, IR at MGTCI and you know be happy to reply. Let me put in the form of a question. Why not, at these low levels, accumulate all the Bitcoin you can above your expenses? And because if you're looking for a recovery time in 2019, it actually answers the previous question that Glenn had, that it would actually build shareholder value and it could also fund the operations at the same time. Would that not be a good idea? Uh, no, sir, I would disagree respectfully. Um, if we go out and we take whatever capital we have and go buy Bitcoins, you know, for one, if we would have been buying them at 6,500 two weeks ago, right now we'd be down, you know, what, 40% no, uh, I mean, and probably I mean, wouldn't be happy about that. So in, instead of, of what, you, what you mine, Keeping 10%, maybe even raising 15% of what you actually mined sitting in reserve because at these low prices, they're sure to appreciate by second quarter 2019. What do you think? Well, sir, you know, for, for one, I, I think as you know, we're, we're currently we're not mining any coins. We we won't be until the towards the late December uh, when we get to our new location. But when we do. We, you know, we're always doing we're always doing evaluations to see what makes the most sense. But you know, keep in mind that you know we're always cognizant of protecting shareholder value, and and you know, mm -hmm. and, and unnecessary dilution uh, is always paramount on our mind. So you know, we we really don't want to uh, you know we don't want to have to sell any more stock to to fund growth uh, than we have to. So we have to look at and weigh we have to weigh the the possibilities. Of what those 10% of sequestered coins can get us as far as a premium compared to you know what what we'd have to you know sell as far as shares to raise equity uh, to fund growth because most importantly uh, you know we're Bitcoin miners so we have to you know we're sitting here it's great we have you know 6,800 machines now and 
you know, it's great that we're in this position, but that's not going to cut it going forward. We're going to have to grow and we're going to have to invest uh, in, in the newer, more efficient hardware uh, to be able to, you know, be at the top of our game. So, you know, that's our primary focus is going to be, is going to be, uh, you know, capitalizing ourselves, buying the new hardware and getting that deployed and trying to be ahead of the, the curve on the run up instead of be reactive, you know, being more proactive and positioning ourselves uh, ahead of that curve instead of just trying to, to react to it. Okay. One last question, then I'll let you go, and I appreciate your time. Uh, because of the new efficiency and everything of the new machines, which is good, um, how many machines do you actually look forward to having in the first quarter of 2019? Uh, can't can't really give you that answer. For one, it would be uh, you know it, it would be a selective disclosure. Um, two, it's also dependent on our, uh, what our what a balance sheet looks like and how much capital we have. And three, it also depends on what the pricing does. You know, I could say this: I, I did, we did not buy. We were offered a VIP uh, pricing on the S15 on the first batch. Uh, typically, I don't buy first batches of any new model that Bitmain brings out. I like to see the the, the first batch come to market working and let the, let the bugs get worked out on somebody else's dime. Um, but uh, in this in this case. We were offered a VIP pricing deal and, and access to, you know, some decent supply or decent numbers, and, you know, we, we respectfully declined it. Um, I, 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 as I said earlier, you know, everything, everything I was seeing and, and the people I speak to, and, you know, I'm not going to name names, but people that are very influential in the crypto industry, specifically Bitcoin, uh, there's been a, an overall bearish sentiment for the last six to eight weeks. So, you know, I, I kind of listened to that sentiment and decided let's wait and you know although I don't want to try to bottom I don't want to try to bottom hunt for the price of Bitcoin uh, I think I got a better shot of trying to bottom feed and buy buy mining hardware you know in a, in a when they're at their lowest or close to their lowest prices yeah. going forward okay I, I don't want to be a hog thank you so much for your time I appreciate it thank you Dan I appreciate your time thank you sir and our next question comes from Gary Corselli. Your line is now open. Hi, guys. Good morning. Um, good morning, guys. Good morning. So um, you, you spoke a little bit about using some of the hash power for some private mining activities maybe moving forward. How big of a market do you see that being in the future? Um, I, I envision it as being a very large part of, of, of hash but uh, what, what, what do we envision moving forward 2019-2020? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that's going to be, ultimately, I think that's going to be the where the hash is going to be. It's going to be on private chains. Um, it's going to be working for the private sector, so to speak. Um, you know, I, I look at us almost like, like a cloud uh, provider would be or, you know, or, or a cloud or a software as a service provider. In our case, it would be a hash as a service type of provider. Um, although I don't see that uh, coming to market in any any major way uh, in 2019. I think it's further out, maybe you know, late 2020, 2021 timeframe after the next halving, because um, I think you know up until the next halving, uh, yeah. Obviously, I, I, I'm bullish on Bitcoin in the long term or the medium medium term. You know, I think. 2019. I'm not making price predictions, but we're going. We're not going to be $4,200 this time next year on on this you know, on this Q3 call, in my opinion. So if that's the case, um, you know, I think the Bitcoin blockchain is probably going to provide you the best upside uh, for your use of power. But you know, well, obviously, as as all Bitcoin miners, we're going to have to really reassess where we're at. You know, come uh, you know May June 2020 when we're looking at that next halving. Uh, because the price of Bitcoin is going to dictate whether or not it's you know it's prudent for us to keep our power on on that chain or move it to another another chain. You know we'll we'll, we'll have to make that decision at that time. But uh, I would say for the foreseeable future and certainly for you know for the next 12 months uh, to the end of 2019, I really don't see any reason that I'm going to be switching off of uh, off of the Bitcoin blockchain. And you know for the record, that even goes for Bitcoin Cash. Uh, you know, I'm a I'm a big I'm more of a Bitcoin maximalist, 
you know, I kind of, uh, I'm sitting back and kind of acting as a, I'm acting as a, as a paid, uh, a paid uh, viewer or listener to the, all this craziness going on with this fork and Bitcoin Cash. And, you know, although it's had, I think, had some sort of a deleterious effect on Bitcoin itself, um, and I think in a, in a larger sense, um, the overall Bitcoin Cash fork has had a significant uh, negative effect on Bitcoin. You know, I think we'd be much higher if, if Bitcoin Cash had never forked off. Uh, with that being said, you know, I I see the value and I see the adoption and you know in Bitcoin and not Bitcoin Cash right now. So, you know, I think uh, I, I believe that you know the New York Stock Exchange and back are not trading Bitcoin Cash on December 12th. They're trading Bitcoin. So I think that says a lot. And the last question is that I see that you know obviously what in your prior statement that a lot of you know, private miners are going to be distressed right now. There's going to be a lot of pressure for them to either close facilities or monetize some of their hardware um, or, or look for uh, being bought out. Um, is, is, is part of your plans looking for distressed miners that could utilize our location and our, 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 our buying power, either using uh, Absolutely. Or, or That's – Look, absolutely. Our cash position, uh, as we as as we build our cash position, uh, that's going to put us in a real good position. Uh, one for organic growth, two as well as potential a uh, potential acquisitive phase. Uh, you know, just speaking to a lot of the people I know in mining, there are just I could I mean tens of thousands of miners that are new old stock in the boxes, still brand new. Are, are being floated out there at, at deeply depressed levels right now, um, you know, and that's one of the reasons that I'm not jumping on the new, you know, fancy S15s, because if I could buy an S9 uh, or, or 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 an S11, which is you know coming to market I think today or tomorrow, um, you know, that's that might be a better opportunity from us going forward. But you know, as I said, having the cash to make the moves and take advantage of the opportunities. Uh, you know, and do it in an expeditious manner is going to be the going to be the key. So, from our perspective, you know, we're really cognizant of trying to build our cash position to be able to to uh, one vet out any acquisition opportunities uh, of other distressed miners that we may be able to go in and 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 do a distressed debt purchase of assets and operations, and or to you know organically grow ourselves uh, you know through uh, expansion of our, our our own mining facilities. Thank you for your answer, and I'm, I'm looking forward to a good 2019. Thank you. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press the star and one on your touchtone phone. And our next question comes from John Ward. Your line is now open. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Can you hear me? Hi. Uh, thanks for doing this call. It's, uh, the information is appreciated. I wanted to uh, ask, I'm a private investor, by the way, and I wanted to ask about, um, is the only real source of liquidity here now the, um, you know, the ATM or the, um, you know, what is, I guess, the L2 agreement? The, the ELOC, are you referring to? Yeah. Uh, yes. While, while we're, we have that small operation, uh, you know, still running in Washington, which is about 500 machines, uh, you know, frankly, at $4,200, those machines are, are uh, not making money, so you know obviously we're not generating cash flow there. So with that being said, our primary me method of of uh, raising capital and liquidity uh, is the L2 equity line of credit. Uh, we obviously are very prudent and you know and judicious about uh, you know, how much we utilize it, but uh, yes, that is our our short term. Uh, liquidity liquidity means uh, until we get our miners up and running uh, next month. Yeah, and the uh, the notes payable, which I guess are coming to uh, a little over three million dollars, right? And that is coming up, right? I mean, you're dealing with that. That's uh, why do we start that in um, in February, right? No, no, uh, the notes gonna... payable. We've been we those notes have been we've been making our monthly payments uh, yeah. as yeah, as 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 obligated. So we've been doing that every month, and and we've been on time making our payments uh, each month up to up to the you know up to current. So 
So we have, uh, I believe, five months or yeah, I think five more months left on uh, on those notes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess the uh, other question is when you when you did write down the S nines, what what number did you guys put on them? If there were twenty five hundred, right? It was in the prior quarter. What did you mark them down to? In terms of value. Okay. I'll let Mr. Lowry go into more detail on that. Uh, we did a pretty, I will say that we did a pretty deep dive into the economics and the earning potential and, and, uh, you know, we were very, uh, very aggressive in haircutting them because, you know, we felt that it would in, it would in, taking the write down now would, would really enhance our 2019, uh, earnings considering we, you know, we're taking a hit now. We're kind of doing the baby out with the bathwater scenario. So I'll let Mr. Lowry go into a little more detail on that. Yeah, that was based on, a, as we said in the 10Q, a, you know, a discounted cash flow analysis over the 18-month period left, and the resulting amount was about just right around $1,000 per machine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a good thanks. All right. You too. Thank you. And we'll take our next question from Chris Rogeski. Your line is now open. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Um, just looking at the recent filings and the number of Bitcoins mined, can you talk a little bit about um, of those 161 Bitcoins mined, how many of those contributed to our, you know, roughly $600,000 in revenue? Uh, I'm just trying to understand how you guys are prioritizing uh, company-owned miners versus investor miners, um, you know, and as we move into Colorado, um, how are we going to decide who's to hook up first? Um, and if you can give us any uh, added costs and estimates on uh, moving from Sweden to Colorado. All right, I'll, I'll take the first one. Of the 161 coins that were mined in the quarter that you spoke of, approximately 85 were mined by our homely owned um, miners, and 76 were mined by the partnerships. And then if you could, yeah, we're Chris, 50, 50, but we have twice as many miners as they do, right? Uh, yeah, it's not quite 50-50, um, but, uh, you know, we, we, we always, uh, you know, we were running in, in the, in the third quarter, we were running, uh, from July on, we were running all the machines. So it's just some machines may have been underperforming. Some, some may have been, you know, over, overperforming. You know, there were a lot of variables, uh, in the summer out there, it was hot. Uh, you know, let me, let me just speak to some, some, you know, and I see where you're going. To kind of speak, address some of your concerns about the move, um, the team that's out there in Colorado, as well as as well as uh, our internal team, uh, we're going to get these machines shipped in there and hooked up. We're not talking months; we're talking about getting them from start to finish, a matter of weeks. I mean, clearly, you know, here we are, you know, middle of November, and we're you know we're stating we're going to be mining, uh, you know, in the next you know five six weeks here. So. Uh, so with that being said, you know, we're not talking about months. So as far as prioritizing whose machines get hooked up first or second, it's we're talking, you know, a, a day or two here and there. They're going to they're all going to get hooked up and they're all going to get hooked up in a, in, a, in a couple of week time period. Um so it's it, it's not like uh the partnerships are getting an advantage, we're getting an advantage. Um they'll all be hooked up, you know, clearly uh you know, within within a short time frame. Um as far as the moving expenses, we uh, we spent a, a, I can't tell you how many hours uh, as as you can imagine, it's not easy shipping 250, 300 pallets from the Arctic Circle to Colorado. So, in, or Arctic Circle in Sweden to Colorado. So we've spent, yeah, you know, I can't even tell you how many dozens of hours dealing with freight forwarders, different international shippers. Uh, we we feel we've got the best price um, for the the service of shipping. You know, we're going to be doing. Uh, uh, of, of variable speed shipping to try to save some money. So instead of shipping everything at the fastest time frame and having 6,000 plus miners land and then just sit there, we're going to try to you know, use maybe two week shipping on the first batch and then send some out four day air. And this way the miners are arriving, uh, and getting hooked up in the most efficient manner where, you know, we could save, you know, 10 or 20 or $30,000 of shipping expenses over just shipping them all, you know, four day air and, 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 you know, the fastest, uh, most cost, costly uh, method to do it. So, uh, I, I would estimate that the overall, uh, price to ship, 
uh, get everything set up is going to be about uh, between 150 and 200 thousand dollars. That's you know probably closer to the higher end of that, closer to the 2,000 200 thousand dollar range. Uh, and as I said, it's 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 in excess of 250 pallets when you take into account both the uh, power supplies as well as the miners themselves. Thank you. Um, do you want to talk at all about the facilities? I think you guys have a really great agreement there in terms of um, that 90% threshold that was in the agreement. Um, you seem pretty confident uh, that we'll at least be able to turn a profit there. Um, and if we get all these miners there, how much room does that leave us for capacity at that 10 megawatts? You know, does that pretty much push at capacity, or do we have room there to add, you know, a rough, pick a rough number, I guess, of capacity we can yeah. add without having to? Take a new building or, or get new power agreements? Yeah, well, in short, I mean, the one building we're contracting for 10 megawatts now, which will which will supply us ample power to plug in all the miners that we currently own, which was our primary concern. Um, as I said, it just coincidentally, uh, there was a little side building to, you know, the, this mega complex that's 600,000 square feet. There was uh, this one side building that, that had a 10 megawatt feed to it, so it worked out fit our needs perfectly and it was just uh just a perfect fit so we jumped on that but as i said i mean right now there you know i i was recently out at the facility uh you know there's 32 megawatts of available power sitting there racks uh, all you have to do is buy miners and have them shipped in and, and plug them in so so i mean there's plenty of uh ability to expand on location um our contracts uh, we we really enjoyed working with the with, with the group that runs the center they've been uh you know they've been you know good partners very very fair in their negotiations so you know we feel that uh, we've got a really good deal as far as pricing and and uh you know service provided so you know we're, we're real happy about it i think it's a good fit um I, i'm not saying that i'm not looking at other places uh, absolutely we you know we're identifying other places that you know we may go into in the future but uh right now this is this is a good fit um you know uh with the carpet being swept out from under all the miners' feet, I think it's just critical for us to have a solid piece of ground under us, and this is this is that ground. You know, it's a good place, fair price, and uh, you know, and most importantly, it's a uh, it's a couple hour travel from anywhere in the country compared to you know 30 hours and the logistics and the headaches we've had you know in Sweden, and you know we have much more control of, of everything there. So uh, so it's a good thing. I think in, you know one of the things that that I think was most critical about the hosting agreement, which I don't know if uh, you know if anybody really caught on to it, but you know we were able to do something which was unique, at least in my experience. We were able to um, to get an agreement to have a, a, a really what I would say was a real fair, uh, cons conservative, minimal cost. So in in the case of the 10 megawatts, our monthly power cost, I believe, would be. Uh, if we drew the full power for the month, nominal 10 megawatts, 24/7, uh, we would be looking at about $408,000 a month in power and hosting fees. Uh, our minimum there is $50,000. So, you know, if there's a month where economics like are just horrible, if Bitcoin goes to 2,500 and difficulty takes, you know, takes two, you know, two cycles to to uh, reassert, reassert themselves and come back into an equilibrium. If we decided we needed to turn off because we didn't want to mine at a, at a major loss, uh, we have that ability where we only have a fifty thousand dollar minimum. So to me, I think that's a huge asset, to, you know, that we're able to negotiate into that agreement. Uh, I've never had it uh, in any of my prior agreements. It's something that hasn't been offered up. But you know, in the supply and demand being what they are right now, uh, I think it's a buyer's market when it comes to uh, miners and hosting centers. So. Uh, you know, we got that in there, and, and I think that's uh, that's critical because you know we're really only looking at uh, a fifty thousand dollar a month minimum, uh, you know, commitment. You know, in 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 a worst case scenario for you know for mining. Great, thank you. Hope you all have a good Thanksgiving. You too. Thanks. Thank you. Too. And our next question comes from Clint Horner. Your line is now open. Clint Horner or Warner, uh, your line is now open. Okay. 
And at this time, it appears that we have no further questions, so I will turn the call back to our speakers for any additional remarks. Yeah, we'd just like to thank everybody who participated in the call and you know, really appreciate everybody uh, doing this with us each quarter. Obviously, this is, uh, you know, this is going to be uh, a long journey for us, you know, it, being in such a, a volatile and uh, nascent industry such as Bitcoin. So, uh, you know, can't tell you how much we appreciate everybody's support and everybody uh, as a shareholder. And we look forward to uh, speaking after the new year uh, on the next call and wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving that's in the United States and a good day to everybody else on the call. Thank you.